Sure. So now we are going to have a session. Yeah, go ahead and come on up and join me. I'm going to be joined on the stage here for a conversation focused on the role of technology in seeding shared value, something that comes up quite frequently. I'm being joined on the stage by Nancy Fund, who's the founder and managing partner of DBL Ventures, a venture fund focused on, as the name and initials suggest, focused on generating double bottom line uh, results for her uh, investors. I'm joined by Ashifi Gogo, who's the CEO and founder of Sproxel, which is a tech company focused on a product called mobile product authentication to ensure that, um, that in emerging markets, the, the um, drugs that people are getting and buying uh, in their communities are authenticated and, and known to be from a, a known source. Uh, Shweb Siddiqui is here from uh, the director of portfolio at the Acumen Fund, a longtime investor uh, in traditional investing places and then came to Acumen and added a social lens uh, to his business in investing Acumen. And finally, Catherine Minshew, who's the co-founder and CEO of The Muse, which is a technology company that facilitates youth career development. Now, as they get ready to go, and I kick it over to Nancy to, um, to moderate this panel, I, I point you towards our pigeonhole uh, poll, and we'll do question number two. And I think it's a perfect question, in particular, for these guys to see the results of. To what extent has your organization embedded social issues into, in, into its innovation approach? And obviously, both Catherine and Ashifi uh, have lived that through their organizations. And it's good to see that the, uh, it, uh, it's, uh, the crowd agrees with you. And so it'll be great to hear the process that, uh, that you two went through in your businesses. So Nancy, thank you. Thank you very much to uh, the shared value team uh, for inviting us here to talk about our, our favorite subject, shared value, impact investing, very linked. Uh, I would just, on that, on that graph, I would just say that uh, we actually believe that, there, that if you don't infuse social issues into your innovation strategy, you're, you're really missing out. This can be an incredibly uh, compelling investment strategy, and you're going to hear about that today from two very different companies uh, operating in, in different countries, different markets, um, and that's, that's part of the, the, the magic of impact investing and, and shared value, is that it really is a big tent. Uh, at, at DBL, we, we see that you, you can build two kinds of um, impact shared value companies. One is kind of the obvious kind, um, and from our portfolio, say a Tesla, you know, unhinging driving from, from fossil fuels. I mean, that's, that's kind of an obvious be benefit. Or Revolution Foods, uh, which we seeded uh, 10 years ago now, uh, serving healthy lunches to low-income school children that don't have access to healthy food. I mean, those are, are great companies uh, that are building uh, shareholder value as they're solving very, very important social problems. On the other hand, there are less obvious impact companies that we we think are just as important. And 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 from our kind of historic portfolio, one of those would be, say, Pandora, the, the internet radio company. Uh, and that is not as obviously uh, full of impact to some people. And so it really what we explain when we talk about why that fits into a impact uh, venture capital practice is it depends on what you're measuring and what you want to accomplish in terms of social goals. And we have a, you know, we like sustainability, we like diversity, we like job creation. Another thing we like is, is a place-based investment strategy that brings the benefits of entrepreneurial activity to neighborhoods that really need it, that just not the Sand Hill Road or the, you know, the traditional places where uh, companies get started. And so when people ask us why we invested in Pandora, we obviously thought it was going to be a great company and investment. But really, the first reason we looked at it was because it was located in Oakland uh, about 10 years ago, when Oakland was still uh, really a troubled community that had uh, not a lot of, of job creation, had high crime. And so that was something we thought we could help fix uh, by investing in Pandora. Now, there's a whole impact story to that company, which we'll save for another day. Um, but that was really where it started. And it can be that simple 
And, and now, of course, 10 years later, Oakland, you know, the New York Times writes about it as, as you know, the new Brooklyn. I mean, as, as a place that people are really heading to and, and is a home for, for creative upstarts like, like Pandora was at the time. So it, it's important to see that in, in uh, impact investing, you can do both. And in fact, we feel you should do both because there's a whole uh, world out there and not everyone wants to do sustainability or not everyone wants to be in an obviously uh, socially oriented um, product uh, company. They may want to be in a company that can, can affect change in different ways. So we're going to explore these, these concepts uh, with, with our guests today. And we're gonna start with, with, with Catherine uh, who is the um, co-founder of a company called The Muse right here in New York City. Uh, Alex, her, her co-founder, uh, and Catherine, um, we, we became aware of, of, um, of The Muse about, what, 18 months ago, and we're really privileged to invest in their Series A, um, and I think it, it's a bit of a record for us. I mean, we invest in a lot of women entrepreneurs, but again, if you ask me, uh, one of the first things that I liked about the Muse is that it, is, it had two women founders because we really do need to get our entrepreneurial leaders to look like America or to look like the world. We can't just continue the same old, same old. And there's a whole world that opens up once you do that. Um, and then extremely compelling business model growth and, and approach to, to the, the task of um, helping people in their first 10 to 15 years of career building. And what you'll hear from Catherine is that, uh, as, as Michael Porter would say, there's a lot of white space out there in terms of using tech tools to help those that, that don't have the advantage of, of knowing how to get a job and get the, the, the career that they really want. So with that, I'll, take, I'll let Catherine explain uh, the Muse and, and its role in, in shared value. Great, well I'm so excited to be here, so thank you so much. Um, I like to describe the Muse as building the most trusted and beloved destination for people to navigate their careers with a particular focus on young people who are getting started or people that are changing careers or making big jumps at various stages in their lives. Um, and so you can think of us a little bit like a marketplace. Uh, we have 50 million people every year who use the Muse to get to that next step. Um, about uh, the average age is 29, so half of them are under 30, uh, about a quarter in their 30s, a quarter 40 and up. We skew more female, uh, about 60 to 65% of our users are women, about 50% of our users are non-white. So it's a very digital, engaged, diverse group. And they're in many cases coming to us because there's something in their career that they don't necessarily have an answer to. Um, whether it's that they're looking for a job on our platform, they're looking for career advice. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the shared value piece of that, but, um, but what's been interesting is we've been able to essentially um, finance and create a really effective and, and highly profitable business model around a product that is almost entirely free for users. It is entirely free for 99.8% of our users. We have a couple of paid products that people can buy. Um, but for us, it was about creating this tremendous amount of value for people with a focus on individuals who may not have access to a mentor, uh, a face-to-face -face, um, connection with someone that can really sponsor them in their career and giving them some of the same tools and resources that um, their more privileged uh, peers or colleagues might have. And on the other side, we've been able to do this because we partner with hundreds of companies, um, some of which are small and not household names, and others of which will be very familiar to people in this room. Um, we work with uh, Facebook and Zappos, HBO, Bloomberg, um, Condé Nast, Marriott, et cetera, et cetera. And for these companies, they're looking to hire uh, particularly in many cases, they're really struggling with how to understand a millennial demographic. Um, in many cases, diversity hiring or veteran hiring is a priority for them, but they don't necessarily have the internal language uh, to really connect with this group. And for us, the, the impetus behind the business, um, there's a, a few different threads that sort of combined that led Alex and I to start the company. Um, but, but one was the experience that I had early in my career. 
And um, I had uh, grown up outside of Washington, D.C. I had one very clear vision of what I thought I wanted to do in my head. It had to do with international relations. And if I'm really honest with myself, I didn't know anybody who worked in international relations and foreign service. I think a lot of my ideas for what that career was like actually came from the television show Alias that used to air on ABC. Anybody familiar? Um, I wanted to be Jennifer Garner. And if you'd asked, you know, 21-year-old me, I don't think I ever would have said that's part of where it came from. But when you don't have access to information about what a career is actually like, you take what you can get. And I think it's incredibly powerful to show people real role models in uh, real careers. And so to make a long story short, I ended up working at McKinsey & Company as a consultant. Um, I realized very quickly that it probably wasn't for me, but I wasn't sure what I did want to do next. And I also found it very challenging to navigate certain aspects of the workplace because of, um, I mean, you know, how, um, I guess for lack of a better word, in some ways uh, very testosterone-fueled certain interactions were. And here I was, my mother had uh, stopped working when I was born. I'd grown up in DC, but I was you know, born in Texas, and I really struggled with some of these little nuances of when and how to assert myself and defend my ideas and communicate with peers, with superiors, et cetera. Um, and I went online, which is where I think many people in the millennial generation go to get answers to questions, and there was nothing. There was nothing that I felt really spoke to the experience I was having and that also um, talked about careers in a really open, honest, authentic way from a variety of different perspectives. And so over the last four and a half years, we've built up uh, one of the most used career advice destinations and job search platforms for millennials. A lot of our writers are from very diverse backgrounds um, and people writing very openly and honestly and candidly about their experience and also providing incredibly tactical tips. So not just send a follow-up note, but here are three different templates for what that might look like and how you might think about it based on your situation. Um, and again, taking the type of advice that used to be passed down from fraternity brother to fraternity brother or father to son and making that accessible to a uh, really wide range uh, of people. And I think it's been really powerful for me to see that, again, there was a white space that I think was, was not being addressed by a lot of the classic sites that we compete with and collaborate with, uh, the LinkedIn's and Deeds of the World, that we were able to go into with both a very, very strong social mission, but also a really clear business model. And by serving the needs of both parties in that transaction, uh, we've been growing, I mean, almost four to five X uh, year over year. And, and so I'm um, really excited to continue doing that. Very strong performance in a, in a market that, as Catherine has described, it, it does have some big players. It is, it is competitive. And yet those statistics that Catherine gave about the high uh, usage by women and minorities, I mean, it's a very robust platform. I think one in four millennials kind of has been on the, the site. But those, those um, uh, women and minority uh, numbers are very different from, say, a LinkedIn or, or the, the, the services that we're all familiar with. And that's, you know, that we felt, you know, that's not okay. I mean, you, you, can't, you, have to, you have to reach out. You have to have something that's meaningful and useful to those that have, have been left behind. How does that play with, with your, those big corporate clients that you, that you mentioned? You know, it's, it's interesting. I would say for some companies that we work with, that is front and center of their goal. And for others, it's, it's a cherry on top. It's an added benefit. It really depends on the organization. I think across the board, there is a, a hunger and a desire for, uh, from a lot of these large companies to really understand the millennial demographic. How do I reach them? How do I hire them? Um, we do a lot of translation both ways. Um, and then we send in photographers and you know, create photos and videos about these companies because I think millennials also have a very high um, bar for authenticity, for learning about an opportunity before they're willing to put a lot of time into applying in this case. And I think that's even more important when you're talking about people um, from diverse backgrounds. Again, um, you know, we speak with a lot of, uh, a lot of Muse users uh, who say, I want to make sure that if I go in to be, for example, one of the few women on an engineering team, that it's a great culture. I want to make sure that if I'm coming to this company from a different background, that they're truly committed uh, to that and not just paying lip service. So I think, it, again, it depends on the business. But I think organizations are waking up to the fact that if, you, if all of your employees look and sound the same, you're only seeing your problem from one angle. You're missing out on so much of the business opportunity, uh, the opportunity to understand your consumers and your, your customers, who in many cases look like America today, which is highly diverse, 
um, very much across demographics, across um, uh, genders, ethnic groups, et cetera. And so I think it's really powerful to help companies have the tools to recruit um, from a, a much more expansive and inclusive set of people and give individuals, I mean, the information to make decisions to find the places that are really going to, to uh, walk the walk and not just post that nice statement that everyone has, you know, that we're committed to being an equal opportunity employer. That's great, that's table stakes. What are you really doing? And, and, and can you create a culture that allows people from different backgrounds to thrive? And I actually love the idea as we become a bigger and more powerful player in the market, really pushing companies that may be on the more reticent end of the spectrum to say, you have to figure out how to adapt your organization um, or you're just not gonna be able to access the best talent because the best talent is doing their research and they're gonna know. Yeah, there's no nowhere to hide nope. from, from millennials. I think we all know that. <laughs> I'm gonna put that on that. I like it. <laughs> um, so, so really interesting, kind of a market failure that you know one size doesn't fit all anymore and too many kind of career sites, uh, if you look at them, they really reflect that belief. Um, and so you're, you're, you're going after that, that kind of market dysfunction. So let's, let's turn to Ashifi and Schweb and, and Sproxel, which from what I gather uh, had, had its genesis kind of in a regulatory failure, uh, the lack of government uh, oversight on you know, something as fundamental as the integrity and quality of the prescription drugs that we take in, in emerging economies. That's right. We, um, we got founded on, uh, unfortunately, a, a tragedy uh, that happened uh, in Nigeria where over uh, 84 infants died from teething syrup that had been uh, tainted with chemicals found in antifreeze. Um, and so you can imagine going to your corner store uh, pharmacy and buying something for your toddler and, and then they die of kidney failure. That's generally uh, an undesired uh, outcome, uh, to say the least. And so. Um, this is a, a story that uh, goes from there where we develop technology that helps consumers make the best purchase decision at a point of sale, uh, irrespective of the infrastructure or lack thereof uh, that they have in their, their local markets. I do have a, a picture I may be able to show if, if the uh, uh, organizers put it up. Uh, that shows uh, the, uh, the factory in which 200 billion of the world's pharmaceuticals are crafted. You even uh, probably don't want to have a, a, a coffee in, in such a dusty environment. Um, and so what Sproxel does is we work with legitimate manufacturers to put unique codes on products so that at the point of purchase, the consumer can reveal the code with their own cell phone and verify to see if it's from the right source or not. And then based on that, they can earn coupons and discounts and loyalty points um, and also learn about the product use and just get more informed uh, to make a better purchase decision at the point of sale. Uh, to date, we've uh, labeled close to two billion products uh, in six countries, uh, and we've expanded well beyond the uh, initial instance of market failure uh, in, uh, in Nigeria to, you know, India is one of our largest markets today. Um, and it's been quite an interesting story because you get a lot of consumers, uh, as a for-profit company, that's, that's uh, how we're, we're set up, you get a lot of consumers uh, calling our call center, which was set up for uh, technical support if you can't use the label or your cell phone is malfunctioning, and they just call us to thank us. You know, this is the, the gratitude, the just raw appreciation that exists when you tap into the white space uh, that, uh, that exists in, in these markets. And it's just been incredibly gratifying uh, for our staff, and I presume my investors as well, uh, <laughs> Acumen, uh, invested in Sproxel a, a few years ago. Um, and it's, it's really, really uh, changed the, the nature in which we, we actually view the world in that uh, there is an opportunity to provide high quality services as a for-profit to countries that you, you wouldn't generally see at the top uh, of a list of uh, countries to, to invest in. From your point of view, that, I mean, a really profound impact, but as an investment, you know, all kinds of uh, risk f flags. Yeah. So I think that, you know, stepping back, just thinking about Acumen and, and our model, Acumen is a, we're a nonprofit organization, but what we do is we raise philanthropy to invest in 
early stage companies like Sproxel in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. I think that's a core part of, of what we do and our goal is that we're taking risks that traditional investors are unwilling to take to help prove out the business model. Um, I think when we invested in Sproxel, it was earning about a couple hundred thousand dollars in revenue, and today we're north about six, seven million dollars of revenue. Um, and getting to that place where this is a company that actually has replicated beyond Nigeria into India, moving into Kenya, but also what's exciting for us and when we think about innovation is moving into new product areas like um, for smallholder farmers with seeds and pesticides because you know, we talk about the health implications of, of fake drugs. Farmers even have greater risk in terms of if they put seeds in the ground that are fake, they find out six months later and they've taken a significant amount of risk um, and that's a huge challenge for them as well. And so that's how we support um, these early stage businesses. And, and our real mission is how do we change the way the world tackles poverty? Um, and that's how we start and we think about each investment and core to that is the innovation. Um, what we've also realized over the last 15 years as, a, as an investing organization, it's not capital alone um, that we're putting into these companies. That's a significant part, but the markets that we're operating, um, some of these uh, companies need further support. So for example, aside from the $1.8 million that we've invested in Sproxel, we've also provided them with a significant amount of support by creating partnerships with larger corporates like SAP. So Shifi went through an SAP boot camp that really took entrepreneurs and how do they turn them into managers and leaders uh, within their organizations as they're evolving from for a startup mode into that next level um, of, of leadership, both in running their organization, but also how do you start talking to that next stage investor um, as well. And so what we've realized that is capital but also developing these partnerships um, are a critical part of us supporting these companies so that now when sort of Sproxel's out there raising their Series B round of funding, um, they're ready to take on the next stage of investor that can help them continue to scale both in product categories but also across uh, geography as well. We talk a lot about the relationship of, of shared value of companies and the government. It feels to me that, that Sproxel is in some way an outsourced regulatory solution <laughs> um, to, because in other parts of the world, you know, the FDA would be doing this or the Department of Agriculture or the Fair Trade Commission. Um, so do they, are, do they acknowledge that you're, you're doing this in a for-profit way, in a scalable way? And are they good with that or they just say, yeah, we don't. We have other fish to fry. We've got other problems, and this is, is one that we're happy to cede to you. That's that's an interesting uh, question. Uh, I've I've realized that during emergencies, uh, decisions happen very rapidly with governments, uh, and we we definitely leverage that. And uh, the the government was looking at a couple of options. It was a large uh, publicly listed uh, French company that was uh, issuing holograms, which was a, a potential solution for the market. But then there were the concerns around literacy. Uh, you know, if you uh, see a hologram on a product, it's hard to understand if it's actually authentic or not. In fact, there are counterfeit holograms that look better than the authentic holograms themselves. Uh, and so if it wouldn't work in the U.S. per se, uh, it would be much more challenging in, in Nigeria. And so the government wanted a solution that the consumer could confirm for them, themselves using their own device. Uh, and we came up with a, a partnership where we didn't charge the government, but we actually allowed them to take all the credits for the hard work, you know, sweat and toil that we were doing. Um, in, in exchange, uh, they recruited a number of these uh, Nigerian uh, movie stars uh, to put on uh, free ads on, uh, on national television uh, showing consumers how to use our service. So we got a lot of marketing benefits out of, uh, uh, out of uh, taking a backseat a little bit on, on recognition, uh, which was a great way to work with the government in a cash-free environment uh, completely FCPA uh, compliance. And so we actually had a very positive experience with the, with the Nigerian government uh, in a way that enabled consumers to participate in effectively keeping tabs on whether the government is, is doing the right job or not. Um, and that has uh, really scaled up. In fact, in that market, the solution ended up being quite effective. And so the government mandated it for all antimalaria products because we're finding fewer and fewer counterfeits once they put on the stickers that we, we put on the products with their unique codes, and then they subsequently mandated it for antibacti uh, antibiotics as well. Um, so we're seeing a lot of good partnerships with governments. It's not always the case. In some markets, the governments may actually be benefiting from counterfeiting, 
Um, and so it, uh, it makes it a little bit more challenging. Uh, but by and large, when the government is receptive, uh, because it's an image problem, if you acknowledge that counterfeits are a problem, uh, it means you're not doing a good job as a government. Once they get beyond that, they, they tend to look for solutions very, very quickly. I noticed you mentioned using sort of popular culture icons, actresses, actors to help help uh, spread the word. I know that uh, at the Muse, you're you're so uh, involved in sort of what what young people how they develop their opinions, the use of social media. How how does that fit into kind of the overall? strategy of the company. Yeah, um, you, you I share mean, that. I, I think that's, uh, I, I hadn't heard that story before, but I, I love it. I love the idea of essentially tapping into trends and topics that people are already following and using those as um, carriers, as it were, for your message. Uh, for us, you know, we started by following what people were looking for. So um, there are 100 million Google queries every single month in English alone about various career-related topics, sorry, just from the US. Um, and so you know, we, we sort of follow not only what are the high-level questions people have, but also to some extent, occasionally, it does have to do with celebrities. So around Jennifer Lawrence and the pay disparity issues, um, that was a big topic. And I think it can be really helpful, whether it's working directly with um, celebrities or individuals who can help spread the message, or simply tapping into some of those themes. Um, but it is, you know, it's, it's interesting how much faster and farther some, a message can travel on social, for example, when you're tapping into the conversations that are already happy, happening versus trying to wave the flag of your brand new own conversation yourself. Absolutely. Um, I know we're going to talk about impact first, but maybe we'll take a few yep. questions from the audience and, and, and wrap up with that. So um, I, we've got these terrific questions here, and we're, I'll start with the uh, a question about how much do impact investors focus on unintended social consequences? For example, if electric cars reach global scale, it will likely require lithium mining at scale too in places like Chile. Um, so I guess that, that's a question for me. And I put this, these kinds of questions, which are totally legitimate questions, there's a little bit of uh, letting the perfect be the enemy of the, the good in this, this line of, of questioning. Uh, because remember, all cars are today using something that's, that's uh, very damaging to our planet and to future generations, uh, oil. So there is, um, you know, there, there's something that, that in, in the grand scheme of things has, has huge um, negative impacts. Lithium mining, uh, you know, has been done for, for many, many years now, and there are many places around the world uh, where it is done. In fact, Tesla, one of the reasons Nevada was on the list for the Gigafactory is because there are some lithium um, deposits there. They're in Canada. There's a fairly active global market for that. Um, and so, and it's also, it's not like a coal miner where you're exposed to danger and, um, you know, black lung disease. I mean, there, there's a relatively st uh, straightforward protocol for lithium mining that does not result in these, these uh, very, very nasty uh, health consequences. Um, so, the, the supply chain is going to be robust and, and broad. It's not going to, you know, I don't know why Chile was, was singled out there, but there are a lot of places that will be able to supply what, what is a growing demand for lithium across all uses. But it, it, it's important not to, to um, stop there, because what the, the car companies are doing, and, and even um, computer companies, is really looking at how to extend the life of lithium batteries, how to recycle them, how to repurpose them, how to keep them for multiple cycles in the economy uh, when they're not quite good enough to, to work in your car because they've, they've been used for 10 years or whatever, but they are, they are good in other applications and they can have an extended life uh, so that you're getting much more use out of that um, you know, original natural resource than you would in a traditional uh, just trade it in and, and buy something new. So I think that what, what we're seeing is a lot of creativity around how to recycle, repurpose, and, and keep these you know, very precious resources in the economy for as many cycles as we can. And then to you know, have a sustainable um, mining infrastructure that addresses needs of 
workers' environment and you know, the insatiable growth of, of uh, electronics in, in the world today. Nancy, what I'd add to that, though, I think a core part of that, and you sort of touched on this, is also the entrepreneurs that we select investing in, in terms of having the core values, in terms of building a sustainable supply chain, being focused on as they scale and grow, that they do it in sort of the most appropriate, sustainable manner. And I think that that's one of the things that when we think about early stage companies that are very small, we are thinking, okay, what are the values of the entrepreneur or the founding team that we're investing in? Um, and how are they going to think about as their business grows and scale, are they going to be good actors in the marketplace? Um, and that's something that we do spend a lot of time thinking about. But again, to your point, it's sort of the perfect solution isn't even here now. And so investing in this innovation, we continue to believe innovation will lead to further innovation um, as well and not to, to forget that either. Yeah. I mean, there's so much more room for improvement once you're at scale and you have the resources to, to go fix a lot of the things that were not optimized in Gen 1. So we have a question for, for Catherine. Uh, what makes Muse specifically a shared value example and not mm -hmm. just a great business idea? And again, this is in, in, uh, in our lingo, we call this no sacrifice. You can, you can do both. Mm -hmm. I think that from the very beginning, um, I wasn't aware of shared value initiative uh, when we were starting the business, obviously. But from day one, in our early uh, sketches and concepts for the company, the potential to have um, a major social impact was just as important for us as the potential to have a major financial outcome uh, for investors. And I think that, um, again, I, I love the concept of no sacrifice. I don't think that those necessarily, um, I think it's a false choice that some people believe that um, providing value and shared value to all stakeholders is mutually exclusive. But for us, we have made a concerted effort uh, when we were two people, uh, when we were 15 people, when we we're you know, getting close to 100, um, to do a number of things and put our resources towards a number of initiatives internally and externally that, don't always, um, that, that aren't always exclusively or primarily serving the bottom line. Um, and whether that's making sure that we're um, answering in great detail some of the emails we get from people who don't have any other resources to turn to, connecting them with career coaching and advisorships, um, at no cost, creating content, again, that, that may, not, may or may not feed into the ultimate business impact, but um, that has that social mission at its core. Um, I think for us, it's, it's imbued in everything we do, and it's also part of how we hire. Uh, I had two interviews this morning before I came here, and, and we always uh, dig very deep on people to make sure that they share the same mission and the same beliefs and ideals, because I think that if that if that belief system doesn't infiltrate every part of your organization, it's much harder to uh, fully embrace it and to make sure that you're making the hard choices. Obviously, you know, when you can get um, both financial return and social return, that's a win-win. But when they're sometimes in, um, and luckily in our business model, it is fairly rare that they're in conflict, um, but we make sure that we have the people in place who say, the social mission is just as is equally as important, um, and that it takes precedence in many cases when there is some sort of conflict, particularly because, again, and to me, and, and this may be a bias of, um, of where I came from, but I cannot imagine building a company for the long term, building a legacy that we hope will last a decade uh, or more without thinking about the ultimate impact, the social mission, and the, and the long term um, effect that we can have. To me, that's, that's the best long-term decision that we could make. We, we almost had, if I could chime in here, we almost had the uh, exact opposite problem, where people, um, upon explaining what we do, actually thought we're a nonprofit. Um, <laughs> because you know, you're out there in these uh, remote countries where remote is actually a relative, uh, relative term. You know, we're fairly remote here uh, compared to uh, Chile, for example. Uh, but around in these remote countries, um, saving people's lives, you must be a nonprofit. And, and if you're a nonprofit trying to uh, insert yourself in a global multinational supply chain uh, at the point where consumers make the, the purchase decision, uh, that's probably one of the hardest uh, sales you could ever pull off. Um, and so we have had to work really hard to explain to people uh, that it is possible to run a business with 70% plus margins year over year that actually helps people in you know, uh, developing nations overseas make good decisions that grow sales for enterprises. You know, it is 
it is perfect alignment with core business principles. Everyone wants to grow sales and a core need that people have in these markets. Um, and so trying to get a better um, filter to identify uh, areas where these two interests align uh, would, would definitely help the, uh, the shared value uh, group to, to better uh, isolate these uh, examples that get, can help breed the understanding. Uh, I'm really hoping that doing business in this way becomes the norm uh, in that businesses do see a place and some value in uh, helping society uh, improve their, their lot. Uh, but it, it may require more of, of uh, explaining that you know, doing good is not only the, the purview of, of nonprofits. Well, and that's a, that's a journey we're all on, of getting a redefinition of, of uh, how business can use impact and shared value to competitive advantage and not just be seen as, as, as do-gooders. Just, just FYI, in terms of how the Muse fits into DBL's criteria for, for impact, um, and we're always, it'll probably have more than three uh, by the time we're, we're years into this, but uh, certainly uh, the gender diversity in entrepreneurs is, is one of our uh, boxes that we like to check off. Um, Venture-backed companies today are only, what, 6% uh, backed or, or founded by women. Uh, last time I looked, women were about half the population, so we, you know, we have a ways to go in terms of addressing that, and so uh, the Muse is a great example of that. Uh, we're also play-based, as I mentioned with my Pandora and Oakland story, and um, you know, I, I don't know what the income level of, of the neighborhood you're in in New York City is, but it's definitely not Park Avenue. <laughs> it, it definitely needs some revitalization, and so you're you're a, you know you're you're helping to put that pulse into is it um, uh, West 25th Street? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, that's another one that we look at, and then of course the, the core business there, are those statistics about reaching out to the underserved parts of our our uh, wannabe workforce, you know, our, our young people that need that, that first job and need those, those, those guideposts throughout the, the first 10 to 15 years, you know, it's easier, frankly, for white men to, to get that help than uh, for people of color and, and women. And so while you can have a product that addresses everybody's uh, needs, uh, you're, you're clearly, um, you're, you're really, um, honing in on uh, some underserved populations. So th those are just three that uh, we, we checked off when we made the investment. And the, the fun part is that you know, we're developing others as, as we go along. So let's, wh why don't you take the question about how can impact investing potentially fill the innovation gap at larger established organizations um, as well as startups, and then we, we kind of had some examples from you two as well about some of your customer base, how they're, they're fitting in. Well, I think for, for us as an organization, again, I think what I alluded to this earlier, but it is developing some partnerships with corporations as well. So we've developed a partnership with Unilever as well um, that is looking to better, better make their supply chain more sustainable. Um, and the partnership is us, you know, finding investments that could eventually feed into our agriculture investments that would feed into Unilever supply chain. And so taking the, our innovation lens, partnering with a large corporation, allowing us to do the work that we do, and then let us uh, learn from that. Um, I think also, again, in the example with, with Ashifi and Sproxel, it is the customers, the beneficiaries are the people that are scratching off um, the, the scratch cards, but it is actually the pharmaceutical companies or the large seed companies that are the ultimate customers of, of the Sproxel product, right? And so it's, again, what we're starting to see is that connection between these larger corporations that are either um, partnering with our companies or working closely with Acumen to identify ways to make their um, companies more sustainable in the, in the Unilever example, I think are the two ways that we're starting to see that happen. I think ultimately, you know, as an investor in each of these companies, we'd ideally believe that some of these larger corporations would come and acquire um, some, of, some of these startups as, and, and to bring them in-house. Um, and make them a core part of, of their own businesses. Absolutely. Do you guys want to comment on that? Or we have time for one more question. I'm excited about the next question. OK. <laughs> so do DBL and Acumen find that traditional investors follow their investments in the Muse and, and 
Sproxel. And I, there's really good news there, and it's, it's, it's changed in the 12 years we've been doing this, uh, where not only do they follow, they actually join us in, in that early stage. Uh, in the Muse, uh, we were joined by uh, Aspect Ventures, which is a women-led, uh, you know, very tech-oriented uh, investment firm that's, that's just, uh, you know, rock stars running that, comp that, that firm and saw it from their own lens. And what you see increasingly is that the, the traditional investors want to understand impact because it's driving their CEOs, it's driving business models, and so there's a lot of cross-fertilization that's happening. Yeah, I'll just add that um, our first crop of very small seed stage investors was a, a mix um, I'd say probably about 40% of people really resonated with the shared value element of the Muse, and 60% were classic um, angel investors, Alexis Ohanian who founded Reddit, some of these people that are looking at tech companies and, and were more focused on the business model. In our Series A, we had two more classic um, return-focused venture capital firms, one East Coast, one West Coast, as well as DBL with a twin double bottom line impact, um, and then I'm not totally allowed to talk about it, but in a couple of weeks there might be some news um, about uh, further uh, traditional investors following uh, your early moves. Yeah, for, from, uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing the same thing. I yeah. think we're starting to see more um, co-investors that are traditional investors, but definitely we've exited a couple of our companies as well to traditional investors. We're seeing that a lot in the technology mm -hmm. and the energy sector. Um, you're seeing a lot of traditional forms of capital start coming in um, and scaling up businesses and A, creating exit opportunities for us. And I think even in the case of Sproxel, um, that's, that's the next big, big step because when we first invested in them, we were the only investor. And I think today if Sproxel were raising money, I think it'd be a very different uh, conversation. But we're starting to see more and more capital flow into this space. Yeah, after, after Acumen, Deutsche Bank um, gave us a, a debt facility of a couple of million dollars. Um, and we're actually on the market raising five million, so uh, we'll, right. see, we'll see how it works out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you've got a great audience yeah, yeah. here. Okay, quickly, we've just got a couple of minutes left, I, and, I, and I know we want to talk about impact first. In one minute, tell us, tell us your story, yeah. and then we'll, I'll wrap it up for us. Yeah, I, th I think you know, one of the questions that we'd always get asked at Acumen is how you know, you're not an impact-first organization. I think one of the things that when we approach um, thinking about impact first is it's a core part of the business. Um, in Sproxel's case, we found that you know, 40 to 50% of the drugs sold in Nigeria were fake. Um, and how do we, and, and as the business scales, uh, the impact scales with it, that you're, there is no sort of competition there. And so that's why whenever we say we're impact first, we go with that lens to say what is the transformation, what is the change that's taking place? And then the question becomes, is there a business model that we think is viable and sustainable underneath that um, change? And one of the reasons we're a nonprofit is we're taking that risk to say, can we prove that it is actually a business model? And in some instances, if it's not, we're also comfortable standing up and saying, yes, this is hugely impactful, but this is not a business. And maybe more traditional forms of philanthropy should be supporting this endeavor and not necessarily a business model behind that. Well, and it's so interesting you bring that up to close because what you're saying and what we do are pretty much the same, and yet if I, if I said we were impact first, I would make a lot of my investors very, very nervous. And, and that's kind of where we are in this field, that the semantics often gets in the way of the actual work that we're doing. Uh, because as a traditional venture capitalist, having mi migrated into an impact practice, it's in my DNA to, to have that no sacrifice. We've got to make the returns. We've, we want to make the, the social impact. Um, and our investors uh, invested in us for that reason. And so part of what uh, forums like this can accomplish is really just to calm everyone down and, and understand that you can do both. Uh, that's why we call it double bottom line uh, there, the, in that no sacrifice approach. Um, and, and this is what we have to do. It isn't, it isn't a, an option anymore. And as you've seen from Sproxel and the Muse, this is where our, our young people are heading. This is what they want. And this really is a powerful tool for, for scaling uh, the best companies uh, over the next decade, as well as addressing our most persistent social problems. So please join me in thanking and, and um, applauding for our panel.